Are you ready for the word today? I see you ready for the word. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to share a message on purpose. Just it's, it's actually a lesson on purpose, so it won't be detailed. This is not a series. What I'm going to do is just allow the Spirit of God in some individual messages here, allow His Spirit to speak to us concerning the things that are happening today. And we're going to look at a lesson on purpose, a lesson on purpose. And this is found in Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. Now, it's going to be a quite lengthy read, but I think it's really worth us to to look at the context of this uh, story that we find uh, in Scripture, this account that we find. And so we're going to look at Mark chapter 10, and we're looking at verse 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do? They said to him, Grant us that we might sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Now move by your spirit as we allow your word to penetrate and permeate our hearts. Speak to us in places, Lord, that we need to hear. Let us not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. Lord, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to just share a word, a lesson on purpose, a lesson on purpose. And um, according to the Christian Research Institute, uh, they surveyed a thousand church attenders and they asked the question, why does the church exist? 89% of the people polled said the church's purpose was to take care of my family and my spiritual needs. Only 11% said the purpose of the church is to win the world for Jesus Christ. Now, although it does not speak for all Christianity, many American Christians are motivated by self-interest. What's in it for me? What can I get? I remember back in the day when I started walking with the Lord, I would hear uh, testimonies of a few people. And there was a common testimony that they uh, were like drug dealers or toe up from the flow up, as they say. They were really, you know, they had things that uh, their lifestyle was a lifestyle that was just utterly in shambles. And then God saved them. And one of the things that they would say is, and he restored everything that I, that I had. And they begin to talk about material things that, that you can gain. If you, if you give your life to Jesus, he will, he will get you that house. or he will set your family straight. And, and that was a common a testimony among different, many different people that I heard. Uh, oftentimes people are motivated by what they can get get when it, even when they come to Christianity. Some people I know, they would go to church to find a, a spouse, to find a partner. They say, that's the, that's the place you go. If you want to find a man or if you want to find a woman, go to church. And some people even go to church to find their uh, spouse. 
How can I make a name for myself? Some people say and, and, and how can I profit from this? And I'll tell you that perspective is a perspective that has uh, existed in Western Christianity for quite some time. It's, it's as if, you know, I, there's things that I want. There are things that, that God can do for me and Christ can do for me and how he can use me and what, and my ministry and, and my church and this. And, and so uh, some preachers actually preach purpose, but they preach purpose telling people that God wants you to be successful. God wants you to have your heart's desire. God, and they'll quote scriptures, Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, if you really un understand that passage of scripture, what he's saying is when God is your focus, hallelujah, when you delight yourself in the Lord, when his way is your way, when his will is your will, when you've fully committed yourself to his plan and purpose for your life, when you delight yourself in him, he gives you the desires of your heart. Now, what's interesting about that is as you are so focused on God and so intertwined with him in an intimate relationship, he begins to place those desires in your heart. You begin to desire things that before him you would never desire. You begin to desire, you know, so-and-so really needs help. You know, this person really needs peace. I could see them going through uh, really a difficult time. You begin to see couples that need the Lord. You begin to see uh, single folks that really need to know how to walk with God. You begin to see things from his perspective. And those are the desires, <clears throat> uh, some of the desires that he puts in your heart. And then he fulfills those desires. So delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires, meaning he put those desires in your heart because you're so focused on him. And then he brings the desires to pass. Hallelujah. Oh, I want you to get that today. See, many people see it as material gain when you come to Christ. In fact, the apostle Peter even said that in the last days, there will be false prophets. They will come and they will preach that godliness is gain. In other words, you're godly and, and he's going to give you this and this and this and this. And boy, don't we hear that message still today? Don't we hear that message coming from some folks? You come to God and he's going to, he's going to bless you. You're going to be blessed going out and blessed coming in. And see, they'll, they'll use scripture. They'll, they'll, they'll share the scripture, but they'll share the scripture to their own desire. Oh, let me let you understand that. They share the scripture from a humanistic, a soulish, a fleshly perspective. It's not a heavenly perspective. So I just want to encourage you that, that Jesus, he does give us abundant life, but that abundant life is realized when we come to him as Lord and Savior, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We give our lives to him. We ask him into our hearts and into our lives. We say, fill me with your spirit. Let me, you be the driver and I'll be the passenger and I will go where you say go. I will commit my ways to you, Lord. And as we do that, see, God begins to make ways out of no way. See, that's when you can sing way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, because you're following him. You're giving yourself to him. You're, you're, you're encouraged by him. You're seeing things from his perspective. So yes, Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. But don't associate the abundant life with an abundance of things. Whoo, hallelujah. I feel my help coming on. <laughs> don't, don't associate the abundant life with things, with trinkets, with, with, with status in society, with, with uh, abilities. I mean, there's many things that many of us can do, but see, when we associate the abundant life with things, with trinkets, with people, with status, with education, with pedigree, with background, then we are missing the purpose. And therefore, oftentimes what we're doing is we're looking at it from a me, from a consumer perspective. We're looking at it from a perspective of what can God do for me? 
You know, I, re I remember Janet Jackson had a song called What, what Have You Done For Me Lately? <laughs> and, and some people approach Christianity from that perspective. What can God do for me? What I, I have a need, I'm going to God. I have a need, I'm going to God. And some people's prayer life consists of petitions. Lord, I need, give me this, give me that. Oh Lord, help me with this and help me with that. Uh, I, now, and it's okay, let me just say that it's okay to bring those issues to God but I want to encourage you to bring that hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, I praise your name. Oh, you are worthy. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. See, bring everything to God, not just your petitions, because God is not the cosmic Santa Claus, right? And he's definitely not the man upstairs. I, I still hear that from time to time. He is, he is not the man upstairs that wants to grant you all of your wishes. No. Now, if you, if you, if you start there, fine. Start from that premise, but dig into the word and get some good discipleship so you can learn who he is. If you start there, that's okay. He, it's all right to start from wherever you can, but you want to begin to get into the word and to be discipled by a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching pastor and a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, like Impact, by the way, hint, hint, I'm just saying. But anyway, you want to get in there and you want to learn who God is so that you may have come from a false premise, but you end up knowing the truth. And you know what the Bible says about the truth? The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And a good Bible believing Bible teaching church is led by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible also tells us where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom, hallelujah. So I wanna encourage you, to not look at it as a, as a self-consumption uh, relationship with God. It's not a transactional relationship. I do this, so God does that. God does that, so I do this. No, it's a relationship. Hallelujah. In an article by Paul Tripp, he's a writer for the Gospel Coalition, which is a fellowship of evangelical churches deeply committed to renewing faith in the gospel of Christ, right? Uh, he writes this. He states five signs of you glorifying yourself. Five signs you glorify yourself. Number one, you parade in public what should be in private. Oh, that reminds me of the Pharisees. You parade in public what should be in private. Remember, Jesus was saying, don't, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites. Those, they pray out in the open and they do things in open. He says, but when you pray, you go to your closet. And you pray to your father in your closet and your father who sees you in secret will do what? Reward you openly. So you know that you're glorifying yourself when you parade in public what you should really do in private. Number two, you know that you are glorifying yourself uh, when you uh, are way too self-referencing. It's all about me. You're too self referencing. I, 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 me, me, me. Well, what am I going to do? What am I going to have? How is that going to impact me? How can I do this? How can I do this? I hear what you guys say, but what about me? I mean, when you are too self-referencing, you are glorifying yourself. Number three, you know that you are glorifying yourself when you talk, when you should be quiet. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. When you talk and you should really be quiet. You know, James says, let, a, let everyone be a quick to hear and so slow to speak and slow to anger. But those who are full of themselves believe that you're so necessary that everybody needs your input. And, and, and so if you believe everybody needs your input and you find yourself like interjecting, there's a conversation that's going on and, and you're interjecting every opportunity and you're listening, but you're not listening to understand. You're listening to for the pause. You're listening for the pause so that you can interject what you think, your philosophy, your belief, your ideology, your thoughts. If you are doing that, you are more inclined to be glorifying yourself than glorifying God. And then number four, you know that you are glorifying yourself when you are quiet when you should speak. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Will, you just said number three was when you speak and you should be quiet. Well, four is when you're quiet and you should speak. And what that means is you might feel that, oh, 
These folks don't know what they're talking about. That You know, I'm not going to even spend my time in this meeting with them. And you may have the very thing they need, but you're so arrogant that you're looking down on all them. What time is it? When can I get out of this place, right? So, so you know that you are full of yourself when you look at people through those eyes of arrogance. When you say, I'm above this, I, I really shouldn't even be here. Listen to how they're talking. They're not even using appropriate grammar. I mean, you're constantly nitpicking and, and you're going on and on. Oh, when is this ever going to end? That is arrogance and you are glorifying yourself. And then lastly, number five, sign that you are glorifying yourself when you care too much about what people think about you. Oh, glory to God. When you care too much about what people think about you, when, when, when you're living life, and everything that you do is based on how you think someone is going to respond to what you're doing, how you think somebody is going to view what you're doing, how you think somebody is going to feel about what you're doing, then you are more and more likely into yourself than anything else. You are glorifying self. So, so, so I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you through this passage of scripture that we see about James and John. And James and John asked Jesus a question, right? Now, let me just let you know who James and John is first before we go into this. James and John, they, are, uh, they were called directly by Jesus. And what's interesting, Jesus gave them the name, the sons of thunder. That's what he did. He called them uh, Boagernes. That's the, the Greek word that he calls them. And it means sons of thunder. You can find that in Mark. Mark chapter 3, 17, the sons of thunder. You know what that means? That means Jesus knew these guys were over the top. If, if you wanted, if you wanted some muscle, you call James and John, right? <laughs> if you wanted some things to happen, you call James and John. In fact, did you know that when the Samaritans didn't want Jesus uh, in that particular area, it was James and John say, let's call down fire like Elijah called down fire and consume the fire. This is James and John. When, 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 when people were preaching the, the gospel and, and they weren't with like the disciples, it was the James and John that told you. Jesus, hey, them, them guys over there preaching the gospel. Jesus said, well, wait a minute. If they're not, if they're not against us, they for us. But it was James and John. So James and John, what's interesting about them also is you will discover in your Bible that James and John was part of Jesus's inner circle. You say, Jesus had an inner circle? He sure did. believe. Now, he didn't discriminate. He didn't exclude. But there were some that were closer to him. And there were three people that were close to Jesus. It was Peter, it was James, and it was John. In fact, some of you know that when uh, Jesus went to heal a little girl, it was uh, Jesus told everybody to leave the room except for Peter, James, and John and the little girl's parents. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, some of us know he's praying he's praying you remember the prayer lord if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless let your will be done not mine well guess what the, the all of the disciples had went with him with the exception of judas all of them went to the garden but then he walked a little further in there and guess who went with him peter james and john in fact on the on the mountain where Jesus revealed his glory. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Here, Jesus goes up to this mountain and, 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 and he's transfigured. Moses and Elijah appear. Well, guess who got a chance to see that? It was Peter, James, and John. See, the other disciples didn't have that kind of access to the activity of Jesus. It was only Peter, James, and John. And we know that here, John and James are kind of boisterous. Hey, God, well, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, let one of us sit on your right hand. Now, you know, Peter, Peter was uh, one to be reckoned with also because Jesus says, you know, I got to go. I'm going to die. Oh, not you, Lord. Now I'll go with you to the ends of the earth. See, I, I like that about Jesus because he has some, he has some really uh, outgoing guys around him in his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. So, so what we discover about this is Peter, uh, James and John, they are leveraging their relationship with Jesus. Hallelujah. Notice that they are, they know they're in the inner circle. They are leveraging their relationship. Hey, Jesus, 
you know, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and one on your left when you get in your glory, because we kind of hanging out with you anyway. We're real close to you anyway. So let's go ahead and make this official that I would be on the right and my brother would be on the left. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't that something? How they're taking this and they're making it, uh, they're taking it to their to their advantage, what they can get, how they can rule. And let me just say this about some of you who've been walking with the Lord for a while. You don't have a monopoly on Jesus. <laughs> you don't have a monopoly on God. You know, God saved you so that you would share the gospel with other people, not for you to look down on. Oh yeah. I remember when I was there. Yeah. You're going to grow. You're going to grow. Oh yeah. I remember that. No, that, that should not be our attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, we should have attitudes of gratitude, but we should also have attitudes that are looking to assist God and assist those we weaker brethren and sister. Those are the ones who are maybe new to the faith and maybe they're growing in their relationship to God. Remember, Paul even told us in Romans chapter 14, he says, when you with a weaker brother, don't, don't do things that could cause that person to stumble. Some people believe you could eat meat and some people believe you can't. And so you being the more spiritual one, you do what's necessary to nurture the younger one. See, God never tells us to look down our nose because I've been there. Oh yeah, I've been saved. 50 years. I've been saved 30 years. You know, I remember hearing that years ago. Let me just a little side note. I remember hearing, you know, people would testify and I went to a church and they'd have testimony service. And, and so people would testify, yeah, I've been walking with the Lord 20 years, 15 years. I'm saying, man, that's a long time. Cause I was just new to the faith, right? I'm one year, two year, three year. I remember when I hit five years, I say, oh man, I've been walking with you for a while. You know, now I look back, I've been pastoring for 23 years, been walking with the Lord for 30, almost 32 years. Oh, 30, th almost 34 years. And I'm saying, wow, God, you are so good great. You're so worthy of praise. But let me say this. You can be walking with God for years and years and be as carnal as you don't know. <laughs> because you've been walking with him doesn't mean that you're dedicated to him. Doesn't mean that you're allowing him access in your life. And so here, uh, James and John, they try to leverage their relationship with Jesus. Now, the problem isn't the question specifically the problem is, is not that they want to rule the kingdom with Jesus. The problem is they are driven by self-interest. See, they're, they're driven by what they can get out of it, how they can rule over others. One commentator says it this way, the verb ask that they share in that scripture is the direct in the direct middle voice, which represents the person acting in the verb as acting in his own interest. It was the self-seeking which inspired the request and was its deepest condemnation to which the Lord pointed. Here, it was, it's okay to rule and reign. In fact, did you know that you and I will rule and reign with, with Christ? That's what the Bible tells us. But see, what they were saying is, hey, let me be on your right hand and my brother on your left. Let's, let's do this thing together, Jesus. We kind of walking together anyway down here. So let's do this together. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of looking into it from a human perspective. I'm not saying this is what the Bible says, but I am saying this. It's possible that they were saying, yeah, yeah, I want some folks that report to me and, 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 and my brother can have some folks and we can run this, Jesus. We can, we can establish the hierarchy. We can establish the kingdom and see what they were saying. They were, they were thinking, and all of the Jews thought that Jesus' kingdom would come in the flesh at that time. They believed that they were going to restore Jerusalem to its glory, and Jesus would be the king of kings. For those who believed he was the Messiah, they know that the, the scripture spoke of the Messiah coming and reestablishing the kingdom. And so if they're believing that Jesus is the Messiah, they're believing that the kingdom is going to be established now because the Messiah is here. This is why it was so difficult for them to receive the fact that Jesus was going to die because they're saying, no, not you, Lord. You're the Messiah. You're coming to establish your kingdom. So James and John, they are driven by self-interest. They're driven by personal interest. And I mentioned before that there are people 
within the church, if you will, or that's not in the church, but think they are being driven by personal interests. It's not about Jesus being the Messiah. It's not about、uh, God having a wonderful plan for our lives. It's more about what can I get out of this relationship with God? And for many people, it's how can I, how can I determine what this relationship should look like? They will serve God.、Uh, you, you hear it. Well, I know I should be in church, but I'm going fishing today. After all, God is out there and the, the, he, he created the, the, the sea and he, he created the forest and, and God is out there and I can worship God under the tree. See, they have their philosophy, they have their own theology, and they're saying, you know what, I can, I can determine how. My relationship with God should be. I, I'm pretty capable of doing that. I, I know that He loves me. I, I know that there are some things that I, I do that's not quite right, but when I get it together, he, he, it'll be okay because He knows my heart. Oh, I know that you've probably heard that. He knows my heart. A lot of people say He knows my heart as a means of not having victory in their life, and they're saying, okay, He knows my heart. He knows that I really mean well. I just ain't doing well. <laughs> He knows my heart. And, and let me just say this there, there's some that preach from that perspective. They, they, they preach from that perspective. That becomes their, their, their theology. And, and when your theology is more self centered than it is Christ centered, then it's off. It's wrong. It doesn't mean that you're going to hell if you are a believer. It just means that your theology is more so to glorify yourself than it is to glorify God. And God desires to always get the glory. The Apostle Paul said it this way if you glory, glory in the Lord and let everything that we do glorify God. So, so I just want to put to bed、uh, the myth, if you will, that when you come to Christ, He will give you all the things、uh, that, that you've been desiring before you came to Him. He will make you prosperous. He will grant your heart's desire. He will、uh, use you and give you ministry. He will use you and give you ministry. Listen to what I'm saying. But that's not the reason to come to Christ. You come to Christ because you lost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because you are a sinner that needs. Salvation, hallelujah. We don't, I'm not coming to Jesus because I want a ministry. It reminds me of when I was a musician back in the day, and I remember that、uh, I would play in secular bands. Uh, because I wasn't walking with the Lord then, but I'm so thankful for my mother. She said, You're not going to play in any clubs until you're an adult. So, all of my, my teenage years, some of my friends played in clubs. I had to play for the high school dance and, you know, <laughs> for those kinds of things, which I did and I enjoyed it. But I'm so thankful that my mom set those boundaries for me so that I wouldn't get entangled in that life prematurely. But I remember once I began to grow as a musician and I became an adult and I would play, I was doing both studio work and band work, and I was in bands. And, and I would see, you know, you get a chance to see musicians, and, you know, sometimes they're in the band with you, sometimes not, you know, and you, you just are part of the community of musicians. And so here I am. I'm a drummer in, in one band, and then I'm a bass player in another band, and, and I'm just enjoying this. So I'm meeting lots of musicians. And I remember I saw a friend of mine. His name was John, which wasn't his name, but I'm going to say John here just in case he's easy to look in or somebody knows him, right? So, John, I saw John. I said, Hey, John, how you doing, man? Now, John and I played in some bands, and, and we sang some songs. That were like very, very questionable because I wasn't walking with the Lord then. So here I, I see John. Hey, John, how you been, man? Oh, yeah, I'm good, man. I, 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 I say, so who are you playing with? And he said, well, you know, I was really trying to make it in some bands and it, it just didn't pan out. So I decided to play in a gospel quartet. I said, you playing in a gospel quartet? He said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm playing. We're going from church to church to church. And I said, well, did you get saved? He said, oh, no, man. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm playing. I'm just playing my guitar. And, and, you know, and that's what he did. And, and I said, wow, it's so interesting how some people, maybe if they couldn't make it in the sec secular community, if you will, they will just resort to playing for the church. And it's in part because. Uh, churches need musicians, amen? And, and I'm a musician. For those, for those you, of you who are musicians that are, are looking, I am not slamming musicians at all. What I'm saying is, 
I would rather know the God uh, that I'm worshiping on my instrument. I would rather have a, a personal relationship with my God. And I'll tell you this, I believe those make the best musicians for church, amen? Those who know why they're worshiping, those who know why they're playing, those who know who they're worshiping, those who know how to worship, how to in, involve themselves in the worship of God and their instruments. So I know that some folks, that are, are in the church, they are not in the Lord, hallelujah. Some people are, are just, hey, they're doing whatever they need to do to get by. And so therefore, even in that case, they are going to church because the church will pay them to be a musician. Now, I understand that there's some controversy around that, and I'm not going to get into the controversy, but what I will say is I would pray that every person that is uh, representing Christ, that is in his house, that they have some substantial relationship with him. Let me keep this moving. Hallelujah. So, 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 so the problem is when, when we believe, when, when, when we feel that we have to do something, when we feel we believe we have to do something in order to achieve achieve God's activity in our life. And, and what that does is that's the underpinnings, if you will, of glorifying self. Have you ever heard this? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to come to God, but I got to get myself together first. Have you ever heard that before? Guess what? What you're saying is you have the power within yourself to do what's necessary to come to God. God says Jesus is the way. <laughs> the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But you're saying, well, let me get everything in order. Let me get everything right. Then I'll come to God. No, you can't get it right. If you could get it right, you wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> Glory to God. If you could get it right, it would have been right and you wouldn't be having that inter- a uh, conversation with yourself saying, well, when I get it, when I get it right, then I'm going to, then I'm going to come to God. You can't get it right. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't see, see this. If, if you believe that when you do, when the Holy spirit does open your heart and soften your heart and will you into relationship with him, then when you get saved, you will say, well, you know what? It was me who came to God. It was me who, who set things in order. Yeah, I remember. Now, I'll, I'll say this. There are times that you and I know we need God. <laughs> and you and I know that what we're doing is wrong. I remember being there. Oh, I was caught up in addic addiction. And I knew I was there. I, I knew I needed help. I didn't know quite how to ask because I felt so guilty. And let me just say this about sin. Sin, when you, when you have an inkling of the word in your heart, when you've maybe attended some Sunday school or maybe some Bible study and, and, and you may not even confess Christ as Lord. I'm not saying you're saying, I'm just saying that when you know the truth and you know you're doing opposite, oh, there's a lot of guilt that's involved in that. Oh, I would ask you to show your hands. I'm not, but I know you know what I'm talking about. When you're feeling so guilty as to what you've done and you, and you said you wouldn't do it again. And here you are, you're doing it again. And when you say, oh, no, no, that, that, that won't happen. And it, and it just happened. And, and right after it happens, the guilt and the shame that you feel when that thing has happened. And then you begin to realize that you don't have the control over that that you thought you had. Some people accept that right away. Some people, it's a long road before you come to that conclusion that, you know what, I don't have the kind of control over this than I, that I thought I had. And with that is guilt, with that is shame, it can become depressive. Uh, it can, you can despair. And sometimes the enemy will use that so that you will silence your mouth to God. Oh, I'm so thankful for the word of God that cuts through all of that. Do you know what God says? God says, if you confess your sin, whew, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's not going to say, okay, yeah, I heard that before. Do you really mean it this time? See, our parents may do that, right? God doesn't do that. He, when, when he knows that that heart is sincere, because you're speaking from a sincere heart when you confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins 
and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That eliminates the power of guilt. Oh, glory to God. Let me say that again. That eliminates the power that guilt had in your life because you know God has forgiven you. Oh, glory to God. Isn't that good news? See, the gospel is good news. It's not condemnation. It's not condemning. He says the world is already condemned. I came into the world that the world might be saved. So, so, so here, some people allow guilt and shame to stop them from crying out to the Lord, thinking that he's going to punish them or he's going to make it hard for them to, uh, to, to uh, enter into relationship with them. Oh, let me let you know that he stands with his arms wide, if you will, just like that father of the prodigal son. When that son came back home, the father was on the porch looking for him, looking for him. He didn't, he didn't get a telegram saying, hey, your son is going to be coming uh, at such and such in time, so stand out on the porch so you can see him coming. No, I believe that father went to that porch regularly. And it just so happened on that particular day, he saw his son and he ran out and they hugged each other. Oh, let God hug you today. Don't stay caught in your sins. Don't stay stuck out there. Uh, they used to say stuck on stupid. I would say, don't be stuck on sin. Don't, don't stay out there and allow the enemy to beat you down and, and to blind your minds from the salvation that's available to you. Hallelujah. So I got to conclude this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move forward here. So, so, so many people believe that you have to do X in order for God to do X. See, that's based on you. That's based on your ability. Now, I wanna encourage you with four thoughts about purpose that you should know. And we're gonna address it from that perspective. Four thoughts about purpose that you should know. And number one, God initiates your purpose. He does, it's God who initiates your purpose. Let's look at Ephesians chapter two. God initiates your purpose. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, it says this, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, that not of who? Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should what? Boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Does everybody see that there? So what we're discovering here when it comes to purpose, we didn't save ourselves. And I'm so thankful that Ephesians is right on point. He said, you are saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. You didn't come to God. He died for you. See, you didn't, now, now we use the term, oh, I came to Jesus, and I understand we use that term, but what I'm, what I'm trying to underscore here is what was necessary to establish relationship with you was done by God. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It is not of works. You didn't say, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And see, this is not something you could have done. Look at Romans. Look at Romans chapter five with me. I'm going to show you something here. In Romans chapter five, and, and this really underscores what I'm saying. It says in Romans chapter five, verse six, for when we were still without strength here, while we could do nothing about our situation, that's what that Greek term without strength means. It means we didn't have the ability to do anything about our situation. We were stuck in a rut, as, as my mom says. There was nothing we could do at all. He says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Everybody see that there? When, when we couldn't do anything, Christ died for us. It wasn't by me. It's not by my works. It's by belief in Christ. Look at what he says. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare die. But look at what it says here in verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. I, I hope I hope you got that today. I hope you got that in your spirit. See, it wasn't anything you could do. You couldn't do what was necessary to establish that relationship with God. So therefore, God did it for you while you were yet sinners. Christ died for you. Oh, I hope that relieves you from the pressures of feeling you have to do something to be accepted by God. Now, there is something that you do. There is a work that's done, but the work is called believe. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever what? Believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus told his disciples that the work that the father wants you to do is to believe that he sent the son. So our work, if you will, is to believe. That's it. That's it. And guess what? There's no work that you do after that to maintain your salvation. <laughs> you can't continue, as Paul says, you can't uh, start a work in the spirit and only, only to continue that work in the flesh or by human means. You can't. However, when you do accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're following God, he will work in you. In fact, let me move to point two. So point number one, God initiates your purpose. Uh, point number two about purpose that you want to know, God works to fulfill his purpose in you. See, that's what he does. He works to fulfill his purpose in you. Look at Philippians, Philippians chapter two. And we're going to look at verse 13. For it is God who does what? who works in you. Everybody see that there? When, when we come to Christ, we are filled with this Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God working in us. When we become believers, he's working in us. There's a work that God is doing, something on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. See, 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 someone on the inside working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. This is what God does. He works on us on the inside and he changes those things on the outside. Now, what that does is it also frees some of you who have heard Christians say, you shouldn't do, be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. And, and why are you talking like this? And why are you wearing that? And, and, and why are you looking at this? And why are you listening to that? Those things are important, but the more important, important issue is who are you serving? If you have God on the inside and you're intimately engaged in relationship with him through prayer and through worship and through reading your word, reading your Bible, then guess what? He works on the inside and he begins to change what you watch. He begins to change how you speak. He begins to change uh, what you listen to. He begins to change what you wear. He begins to change things in your life that, that you couldn't change. In fact, you didn't even believe most of that was problematic. <laughs> Glory to God. But when you came into the knowledge of the truth, the Lord began to give you a sensitivity to not only him, but to uh, people in your family. He gave you a sensitivity to how you fit in society. He began to give you a sensitivity to how to shine as lights in darkness and how to be salty in the earth. Oh, hallelujah. So, so we discover here that God initiates your purpose, that God works to fulfill his purpose. And you look at Romans chapter eight. Some of you know this Romans chapter eight. Let's look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who what? Who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And if you're called according to his purpose, that means you're aligning yourself with our God. You're saying, okay, God, your will is what's most important. My will doesn't even matter. It's your will. It's your way. Uh, it's, it's your thought. I, I, I desire to have more of you in my life. And when that occurs, guess what? We are fulfilling his purpose. We are, we, he, he positions us to fulfill his purpose. Number three, number three, the third thing that I want you to understand about purpose is your purpose includes serving others. It does. Now we're going to go back to our main passage of scripture in Mark and look at what it says here in Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called James and John to himself and said, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lorded over them. 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. See, he's saying your concept of what you're asking is it's, it's the wrong concept and you're asking with the wrong heart. It shouldn't be among you. But look at what he says. He says it shouldn't be uh among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slaves of all. Everybody see that there? Oh, I'm so thankful for Jesus's reply to James and John who let us be on your right hand on the left. He said, you know what, what you're asking for, you're asking from the perspective of unbelievers. In other words, this is how unbelievers engage. And you're, you're asking from that perspective so that you can have authority over people and you can lord that authority over people. But that's not how the kingdom works. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you're hearing that. I hope you're hearing that those who are aspiring uh, for Christian leadership, we don't lord over people. We serve people. I'm, I'm so thankful I'm a pastor. I get a chance to serve folks. I get a chance to be there uh, in, their, in their high times and be there in their low times. I get a chance to share a word of God in season and a word of God out of season. We are servants of the most high God. I'm not going to have people coming around kissing my ring. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, no. Or, or bowing before me. Or now, now I know that there are times folks want to bless me. And I, and I appreciate that. I've learned. I've learned that God moves on people's hearts every now and then. And they'll give you what's called a Pentecostal handshake. That's what they used to call it. That's when somebody after, after preaching, you shake your hand. And when you, when they shake your hand, you feel something in it, right? <laughs> Oftentimes it's a 20 or a hundred, whatever they put, they, they call that a Pentecostal handshake. And every now and then, uh, after the shelter in place, if you choose <laughs> that Pentecostal handshake, I'll shake your hand, hallelujah, but I don't want you kissing my ring. <laughs> I don't want you bowing before me. I am not your God. I'm your pastor, but I am not your God. God is our God. Amen. And God is the one that we give our allegiance to. God is the one who we worship. God is the one that remains on the throne of our hearts and on the throne of our minds. And we should never exalt men above God. Oh, hallelujah. I got to dance on that one. <laughs> we should never exalt men above over God. I want to help you. Now, if you find yourself in that situation, and I know I remember when I was, but it wasn't on purpose. It was like I was a young believer. I didn't quite know the word and I was learning and that, that man knew the word. He preached and he taught us the word. And so I would just depend on him. I would depend on the word that was coming from him. But I'm so thankful that somewhere down the road, God weaned me off the man himself and he, and he put me on the Bible specifically directly hallelujah and so i'm not saying don't 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 receive from the man or woman of god you want to receive from the man or woman of god until you are mature enough to begin to eat the meat hallelujah i remember uh, i remember one of my daughters what we did we used to grind up uh, we were poor at the time. We used to grind up lunch meat and, and spam and other things because she, she was little. We used to grind it up and, and make it palatable for her to eat, right? So here, there's some times that you might need it a little grind it up and the, and the preachers could help grind it up and give it to you. But there comes a time when your teeth come in, hallelujah, and you need to begin to eat that meat for yourself. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, so let's let's conclude this. So number three, your purpose includes serving others. Let me just say this. Did you know that believers should be the best servants? Did you? It's in our DNA. It's in our spiritual DNA to serve. It really is, which leads us to our fourth point about purpose that you should know. And that is Jesus is the example of fulfilling purpose. He is the example. Look at what he tells James and John in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says this. For even the son of man did not come to what? Be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, if there was anyone whose ring we need to kiss, it would have been Jesus. But you, but you see what he said? He said, I didn't come to be served. Here, God incarnate, God the son, the, 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 uh, the member of the, the, the triune Godhead, the one person uh, of the, the one God 
represented in three persons and God the Son comes down. The Bible tells us that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on a form of a servant, being made in a likeness of man. And then he became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Talk about a servant. Oh yes, that's what he did for you. And that's what he did for me. What a great example we see in our Jesus. If you want to, if you want to be somebody, he says, yes, I want you. I want you to serve. I want you to serve others. And I am your example. I get, I serve to the degree that I served myself. I served all that I was. Some people say, well, how much did Jesus love me? Did he love me this much? Did he love me this much? Did he love me that much? No, you know, he loved you so much that he laid himself out on the cross and died for you. So my challenge to you at this particular time is, who are you serving? You can't serve two masters. You can't. We, we discovered that in our uh, giving video today. You can't serve two masters. Can't serve God and money. But you also can't serve God and serve self. And I want to encourage you today, if you find yourself fitting more in that self category as you were listening to this message, God doesn't condemn you. He wants you to hear these kind of messages so that you can make decisions to serve him rather than self, so that you can move forward with him rather than tradition or rather than thoughts or rather than history or rather than a perspective, a family perspective. He wants you to move forward with him. Where are you serving others? Let's say, oh yeah, I know, I know, I, I know Jesus, Pastor Will. I, I have a relationship with him. Where are you serving others? You know, some people say uh, this shelter in place hinders our ability to serve. In, in, in many ways it does, but guess what? There are telephones, there's Zoom rooms, there's technology. You may, you may serve by encouraging people during this time, by getting the church phone directory and just calling and saying, hey, you know what? I just want to say God loves you and I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Click. No, I'm not saying just hang up. <laughs> but but you look at that there. I mean, you may just call on, on or or you may join us on the 12 o'clock prayer. You say, well, Pastor Will, I don't pray too well. That's OK. You don't even have to pray. Mother Yancey, Mother Yancey be leading us and she be praying. She in her prayer closet praying. So, you know, God is listening. She's in her prayer closet and I'm and I'm praying and we're praying. And, and if you don't want to pray, it's OK to not pray, but you can be amongst us praying. And you can, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's in the midst. So I want to see, there's some ways that you may be able to serve. You know, God is actually expanding this technology ministry. He really is. And we have some things on the horizon that you guys will see here uh, as soon as God releases it. But guess what? We, we even need some more folks that are technologically savvy. If, if you have a computer and you have home internet, we need you. We, we want to we wanna allow you to serve in this technologically, te technological way so that we can continue uh, not only this, but providing other uh, ministries via Zoom and Facebook and that. So, so don't let this shelter in place stop you. And let me just say this for those of you who may not be members of Impact Church, but you've been participating in our service regularly. Hey, we need you too. It's, it's not about being a member. It's about, it's about being used by God. We can work out that membership stuff later on. If you Now, let me just qualify that by saying, now, if you're a member of a church, then you need to seek ways to be actively engaged in your church. So I'm not trying to say, just come on here. But if you're not a member of a church, you say, hey, Pastor Will, I'm not a member of a church, but I've been really enjoying your, your uh, Facebook sermons or, or your, your, your Facebook page your church's page. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I want to join. That's totally fine. You don't have to join in order to engage with us. Just get busy for the Lord. That's all I say. Just, just get busy for the Lord. Let the Lord do what he wants to do in you. In fact, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to, I'm going to close in prayer, but just before I close, I'm going to issue the 90 day challenge. Now, some of you at impact, you know what this is because every now and then the Holy spirit would, 
would guide my heart to offer this. And I'm going to offer it this time, the 90 day challenge. That is the 90 day challenge to, to trust God and watch what God will do in your life for at least 90 days. And, and so that 90 days challenge, it's like, okay, just attend worship service with us right here online for 90 days. Attend worship service and watch what God does for you. Uh, commit to Bible study or commit to studying a word. I'm not saying commit to our Bible study. You can if you want to, but commit to reading the word daily for 90 days. Commit to, to doing that. And then commit to serving in some capacity for 90 days. It may be the phone call, or it may be technology ministry. It may be something in your area, because I know that there's some people in other states that are on this Zoom meeting. And so I would say find things that you can uh, do to serve others, and you're serving God by serving others in the area that you are in. And I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to do this for 90 days. You know, Malachi, God says, try me. Test me and see what I if I won't open the windows of heaven. Some of you know that, right? I just want to encourage you for 90 days, give God this opportunity to show himself strong on your behalf for 90 days. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, it's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. You encourage us. You give us, you give us what's necessary, Lord, to to grow in deeper relationship with you. And I thank you for your word that you've shared with us today that keeps us away from self-interest and keeps us focused on your purpose for us, your desire for us, your will for us. And that's what we want, Lord. We, we, we don't want our will. We don't want our desires. We want your will, Lord. So move by your spirit in our lives and in, in, in the lives of every hearer today that we would receive what you have said and that we would operate accordingly, that we would trust you, that we would not be motivated by guilt and fear and shame, that, that it's addressed by the cross. We, we understand today, Lord, that that was addressed by the cross. No longer will we be victim of guilt or shame, but now we will be victors by grace. We will be victors in, in, in mercy. Thank you, Lord, for doing what you've done. Had nothing to do while we were yet without strength. We couldn't even have done it ourselves. And we thank you for providing salvation for us now. I pray, Lord, for everyone that's under the sound of my voice. Minister to them as only you can. By the power of your Holy Spirit in their lives, draw them to you and draw them to ministry through you. Draw them to serving others. We, the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few. We need those who would serve out of a pure heart so that people could see that you and your love still exist in the world today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.